Greetings and felicitations. Hip hip hurrah. Tally ho. Star Wars Attack of the Clones. Hey, let's talk about this movie, baby. All right, let's do it. And also we want to welcome back Lee Red 2. Thanks for having me. Excited again to uh, talk some Star Wars. Hello, Lee. Release date was May 12th, 2002. Well, we know it took in $649.4 million to date. The budget was $115 million. No doubt about it. It was a financial success. They spent a lot of money on this, but, you know, they got it back. It was set 10 years after The Phantom Menace. We could tell because... The Anakin, kids were grown up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Anakin was the most obvious one. You got to see him as a young man instead of a little boy. Yes, and I'm glad they got a different actor to play him. Yes, <laughs> instead of just waiting for Jake Lloyd to be his real age at that time, which would make it super awkward. Yes. But the now the age difference between Padme and Anakin wasn't too stark, at least visually. Right, they look closer to the same age, and um, they look much better as a couple. They actually put a beard on Obi-Wan, so now he's starting to look and feel like the Obi-Wan that we grew up with. Yes, and starting to act more like him. They gave him uh, more of the lines and everything, and he... Uh, so he, he almost became the Obi-Wan we know. We we, could, we can see it now happening. Mm -hmm. It was directed by George Lucas, produced by Rick McCollum, screenplay by George Lucas and Jonathan Hales, with a story by George Lucas. The music was by John Williams. Production company was Lucasfilm Limited, 20th Century Fox. No doubt about it, we have to talk about the casting, because the casting on this one was much different than the casting of the films up to date. So we're talking not the chronology of the story, but with regards to the releases, we had the original trilogy, we had Star Wars Episode One, The Phantom Menace, and now Attack of the Clones. Big difference. What did you think about the casting, Lee? I think one of the things that really stuck out to me about the production of Attack of the Clones uh, versus uh, some of the other movies, and, and, and Starlog made a point of this, is how star-heavy Attack of the Clones was. Uh, you know, by this point, uh, some of the original stars from Phantom Menace have become a little bit more popular. And, of course, you have Samuel Jackson. Uh, but you're going to add Jimmy Smits, and you're going to add Christopher Lee, who's, who's a real heavy hitter as well. Uh, so you can almost sense uh, just in that how in, in the past George Lucas always casted these no-names with with the, a couple of exceptions, of course, in New Hope. And this movie being a lot more star-heavy, uh, it, it it maybe w was a bad sign and in, in some of the things to come, you know, not to trash it, trash it too hard. But uh, like I said, it's my least favorite of, of the Star Wars movies, but my least favorite Star Wars movie is still a Star Wars movie. So there is that. Yeah, it's worth noting. U starring Ewing McGregor, Natalie Portman, Hayden Christensen, Ian McDermott, Samuel L. Jackson, Christopher Lee, Anthony Daniels, Kenny Baker and Frank Oz. I mean, what did you think about having Christopher Lee in the movie as an antagonist? Yes, uh, I mean, I think he did a great job. But but I'll just say that he, he did make a good villain in this. Um, a, a very stark contrast to Darth Maul, the villain in the previous movie. So here you have this villain who was, you, you just think, well, that's an old man. <laughs> he did do a good job He because you could tell he was devious. Um, he had his plotting, his planning, and... And he could use the lightsaber. He he was great with that. So he did turn out to be a formidable foe. A lot of the filming was done at the Fox Studios in Australia. Also, there was additional f footage filmed in Tunisia, Spain, and Italy. So again, they went to great lengths to make sure that the sets were vast and exotic. And I think they did a wonderful job with so much of the visual effects Overall, it was this was you got to figure during this time, 2000, 2001, 2002. I mean, that that early part of the millennium, everything was about CGI. Lee, what did you think about the visual effects? And oh man, I think uh, <laughs> I think the thing that bothers me the most watching it, and it, and it stuck out the first few times, but now I'd rewatch it, it really bugs me, is how digital everything is. Uh, you know, you go back to the the original trilogy. And everything has pretty much 3D effects. 
Uh, and then when you get to Attack of the Clones, it's like George Lucas being George Lucas is always a little bit ahead of everybody else. And I think in this particular movie, he was pushing further than the technology or his understanding of the technology allowed him to go. Uh, and, and I think when you look at some of the scenes, they just look flat. Uh, they look computer generated. Uh, and, and I think that stands out a little bit and it's a big detriment to the film. Uh, so it, it, it just, it's the one out of the George Lucas Star Wars movies. Uh, that I feel like he just did not execute the technology and the special effects the way that uh, we grew grown accustomed to at that point. Yeah, there were a lot of instances where the CGI was a bit over the top. We could see that. I, I think uh, because, you know, because George Lucas could do the, the CGI in this one and he couldn't uh, in the first three movies. I mean, he, he just wanted this to be more spectacular and to show like, oh, look, this is what we can do. And and so it yeah it became a little too much and it became a little too obvious that that is true, and that was the trend at the time. We see now that oftentimes audiences want the physical reality, not necessarily the over the top CGI. Modern movies now are trying to fine tune the blend between having an actor and the CGI. But during that time period, that that was. That was the future of movies, what, what we were expecting. But, but the, the visual effects were beautiful. Um, if you look at the, you know, the love scenes on Naboo, mm -hmm. the, um, the, when they were in the tall grass, I mean, that was, that was just a great scene that the, um, showing the, the romance of it. I mean, showing those parts. Um, I mean, that, that was wonderful to see. Yeah. I think that had to do a lot with the locations that they were filmed on. And they're known for filming, starting with the original Star Wars, going to locales that were very unique. Star Wars electronic lightsabers. Which side will you choose? The side of Anakin Skywalker or the dark side of Darth Tyrannus? With clashing sounds and light up blades, the force is in your hands with Star Wars electronic lightsabers, each sold separately. A lot of tidbits of unique things that happened with, with the filming. We know that Hayden Christensen, he was very fond of filming in the bar scene because it was a real set, not just a green screen. So that's something that was not CGI'd. And in that bar, the actors who were behind makeup and behind masks, actually, we got to see their faces like Anthony Daniels. And also Samuel L. Jackson, he was, he had a, finally, his lightsaber got lit up in this movie. And wasn't that something? <laughs> Purple lightsaber. He was able to talk George Lucas into getting a unique color for his lightsaber. And that was good. Yeah, to to show that the Jedi can have different colors and and when you watch all the saber fights, the and the colors help make it. I mean, mm -hmm. yes, that was great. And apparently the words bad mf -er are engraved on the hilt of his lightsaber. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know what? I think I saw it. No. <laughs> and also we're able to see some foreshadowing of how Boba Fett was able to use tactics later on in his life because according to George Lucas when Obi-Wan Kenobi was hiding in the asteroid field we remember that young Boba Fett was in Slave 1 and he was able to see him hiding in the asteroids and this was a tactic that Boba Fett would later on use historically in the movies in Empire Strikes Back. And, and that was great too to see uh, the young Boba Fett in this movie mm -hmm. and to see him as a little boy and, and then also to see, you know, the scene where he, where his father got killed and he saw that mm -hmm. and that was, that was very tragic and then, and then like you don't know what happened to him, like how did, who raised him after that? Yes. And also during the fight scenes with Count Dooku's lightsaber battle, a small model of Yoda was used as a reference point for Christopher Lee. Oh, so he would know what, like, what, this is where Yoda's supposed to be, so this is where I strike. Mm -hmm. Yes. That that was a strange scene, too. Um, Yoda w was always a good character, especially, like, in The Empire Strikes Back. And then when you come to this movie where we can do the CGI and where you can have Yoda levitating and, and do it using the lightsaber, that, yeah, that kind of looked a little silly to me. That part kind of took me out of the movie. Was it too much for you? It, yeah, it, it just didn't It just didn't quite seem right. I remember that was one of the parts in the movie when everyone cheered because we couldn't believe that Yoda had a lightsaber and he was using a cane the entire time and then yeah. he cuts <laughs> yeah. loose. <laughs> yeah, using a cane and then we find out, well, he doesn't even need to walk. He can levitate. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, Yoda, was, he was very good, though. He's very adept at a lightsaber. I know that 
for me, one of my most anticipated moments in the movie was to see anything and everything with Django Fett. Because when they showed teasers of Django Fett being involved, I said, this is... I mean, just look at the armor. It's very much like Boba Fett armor, but tweaked a little bit differently, a different color scheme. That was one of the things that I anticipated. How about you, Lee? What did you anticipate going into the movie? Man, I guess uh, what got me really excited and the thing I was looking forward to the most uh, has to be the, the anticipation of seeing all the Jedi in a battle scene. You know, it's something that ever since you're little and you watch New Hope and, and Empire Strikes Back, you, you, you hear of the Jedi and the Clone Wars and all this stuff. And uh, with the Attack of the Clones, you went in expecting to see just that. It's just uh, you're ready to see the Jedi and all the Jedi fight and, you know, holding hope that Yoda is going to be one, which there started to be some rumors about seeing Yoda fight uh, as the movie is coming out, has to be the thing that I was most excited for, for sure. How about you, baby doll? Was there anything that you were especially looking forward to? Well, I, I was, you know, hoping it was better than the previous movie. Which was um, a very but, easy which, feat. Right. <laughs> yeah. But but I was looking forward to seeing Hayden Christensen because this was his first time in a Star Wars movie. And I wanted to see what, what this version of Anakin looks like. And, and I think he did a great job in that part. Mm-hmm. It was kind of curious that the opening crawl mentioned Count Dooku, but we didn't get to see Count Dooku until easily half the movie, which is so different than the other Star Wars movies because – we see the antagonist usually immediately or pretty close to the beginning. So there is a big buildup for the character of Count Dooku. This movie spent a lot of time with, with the buildup, yes, with, with, with finding the clones. I mean, they had to go through, through that and they had, and they had to, to have the, um, the, the scenes with Anakin and Amadala and, and those were good scenes too. They had to, they had to show the romance. They had to show that these two were falling in love because that's how they, you know, later had the twins. And, and I, I just want to say that, um, Natalie Portman did a great job in this movie. This mm-hmm. one w- was her standout of, of these films. She got to do the romance scenes, but she also got to do the action scenes and she got to shine in this movie because she got to fight and everything and, and, and kiss and just, you know, do all those things. Um, in the next movie, she was pregnant through most of the movie. So we didn't see her in as much as the, of the action. So in this one, um, uh, it was her best. I loved her in this one. Yeah, agreed. And her outfits were amazing. Do you remember when we got to see, we took a trip to at, Cincinnati. At museum, yeah. Yes. Went to Cincinnati to the museum. They had a traveling exhibit of, the costumes of Star Wars and the Amidala ones, the detail, the embroidery, the imagination behind all of them were nothing short of stunning. They, they were so beautiful and extravagant. And, and of course, when you can just stop there and stare at it in a museum, you see all the things that you, you couldn't notice in the movie. Um, yeah, that there was a lot more there than, than what you saw in the movie. And, you know, and it was just beautiful. Star Wars, new Obi-Wan Kenobi and Jingo Fett, electronic battling figures. Don't move, kid. You control every battle and all the action. Star Wars, electronic battling Obi-Wan Kenobi and Jingo Fett, each sold separately. It's interesting to note that there were only three actors that were part of this movie from the original trilogy. Anthony Daniels, Kenny Baker, and Ian McDermott. They reprised their roles of C-3PO, R2-D2, and The Emperor. Uh, yes, Frank Oz, if you want to consider him as the puppeteer as well, uh, as Yoda, but the bulk of Yoda was CGI, and this is the first time we talked about the, the, the fight scenes with Yoda, but virtually everything with Yoda in this movie was CGI. Now, the, the droid scene, the droid factory scene was wow, you want to talk about CGI and steroids with <laughs> R2D2 flying and Everything that was involved there, Lee. What did you think about the droid factory scene? <laughs> I think I think the other thing that really stands out uh, in just production choices and story choice choices. You know, everybody always accuses uh, Lucas, and, and, and maybe rightfully so to some degree, uh, of creating characters and scenes to sell toys. You know, like the Ewoks or whatnot. Although I'll say I 100 percent understand where the Ewoks are in the story. Love it, appreciated it, have since Return of the Jedi came out. But in this movie, there's a couple of scenes that it's just baffling. Like, why? 
why did we make this scene? Uh, the horrible droid factory scene with C-3PO, R2-D2, uh, it's, it's just miserable. It's, it's, it reminds me of the scene when you're playing a video game and, and this comes up in a video game and you're like, well, that's not in the movie. Why is it even there? Except this, in this case, it is actually in the movie, and you wish it wasn't. Uh, probably my least favorite sequence of all Star Wars movies uh, at that moment in Attack of the Clones. How about you, Baby Doll? What did you think about the droid factory scene? Well, it was, I mean, it was entertaining. But, but you know, when when you look back at it, I mean, well, well, you know, the thing that we discussed, it was kind of like Indiana Jones. I mean, just the, <laughs> it was. being in peril and being in, in and trying to get out of it and, and actually making it out of it. Um, it, yeah, it was a little far fetched, but I mean, but hey, it, it's a movie. It has this, it has this adventure. It has the peril, the danger and, and we go with it. And, and yeah, it was a fun scene. Yeah. Again, it was that time period. And like Lee said, knowing what George has in mind for merchandising, well, now, They've got R2-D2 toys where you can fly and all these other random robots. So I think if I was the age that I was when I saw the original trilogy, I would have liked that droid scene even more so because I would have more toys to play with on that level. Episode 2 action figures give you the power of the Jedi. Jango Fett in his Slave 1 launches a sneak attack. Your Jedi Starfighter blasts from flight to fight mode and fires, but Django escapes. As Obi-Wan Kenobi uses force-flipping action to leap into battle, but Darth Tyrannus is no pushover. Django Fett takes out Mace Windu. You can use the force to summon a lightsaber into Obi-Wan's hand. Missile deflected. And the massive Reach charges in with its stomping attack. Anakin strikes back with two lightsabers. With Star Wars Episode Two action figures, the Force is in your hands. A galaxy of beasts, vehicles, and action figures each sold separately. This movie had a little bit of something for everyone, I would say. It was such an, a much better Star Wars than the previous one that I think that's one of the reasons why it got more accolades than The Phantom Menace. I, I think the previous one had... It, it had too much, uh, politics and a lot more, a lot more story stuff going on. This one was a little bit simpler. It was a little bit easier to follow. And, um, and also, ha- you know, had great entertainment value. A- and, and it was very, it was very fast paced. So, so we get that from it, like, like we expect from the Star Wars movies and all the adventure and all the scenes. They did seem to change scenes a lot. Again, we kind of compared it to Indiana Jones, how it, how they kept going from place to place and everything. Mm-hmm. It, you know, just looked different every time. I mean, which is great to see, but it's just, uh, it, it, it is kind of overwhelming. It, it, you kind of go, whoa, there's just so much in this. But, but then you think, well, that, that's what's great about it too. So it was fun revisiting that movie. And thank you again for this trip down memory lane. We are still having the countdown to episode nine next Special is going to be Star Wars Revenge of the Sith. Thanks for listening. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and join our Facebook group. Live long and may the Force be with you. Nanu Nanu. Nanu.